The pensions of former governors and other officials of Lagos State is being threatened as the Lagos State House of Assembly just recently approved the report of its Committee on Establishment, which recommended the reduction of the pension by 50%. The committee also expunged the provision of providing houses in Abuja and Lagos for the former governors and reduced the number of vehicles to be made available for ex-governors and their deputies. A special report published in 2019 revealed that 21 states spent over 37 billion in serving 40, or servicing 47 ex-governors and their deputies between 2015 and 2019. Four states, Bochi, Rivers, Akwaibom and Lagos, topped the big spenders list. Now joining us to discuss this is Gideo Ologun, he's a legal practitioner, and Achike Chude, political analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Mr. Logo, you're a lawyer, so, and, and uh, this committee has expressly said what they want to keep and what they want to take. But it beats me because, I mean, this might come as, in, as news to so many other people, but I have talked about this issue, and not just in Lagos State, but several other states, about how much money goes into servicing former governors and their deputies. For a country where we are, uh, our, our account is going, is ballooning, let me say that, uh, or we're going belly up, should we still be allowing for these things to continue? You, you just mentioned it now. If our economy were to be buoyant, then there won't be a big deal in taking care of these as governors. But as Nigeria remains the capital of poverty, I think our attention should be on how to cushion the impact of poverty on the people. And one of the areas of making sacrifice is the areas of those who probably were overtaking care of in office. You, we all know what it means to be a governor of a state in Nigeria for four years. We now talk about eight years. Whether we admit it or not, quite a number of them have properties across the state, across the country, some have investments abroad, they can easily take care of themselves. But in a situation where, for example, in Sapoto State under the pension law passed in 2013, Sapoto State as the capital of poverty in Nigeria reportedly, you know, spent about 200 million to 180 million on former governors and deputies and provides them with domestic aid, residential and office accommodation, vehicles replaceable every four years. And what is paid to these former governors is the equivalent of the basic earning of the incumbent governor. So it's like they are not out of office at all. And when you take an ex-governor like Oji Uzokalu, who is now a senator, you take a former governor like uh, Honorable Raji Fashola, who is now a minister, you find out that on both ends, they are still enjoying like this of the government while the people are languishing in poverty. So if you are to consider the plight of the people, first side of the argument, I believe that on the other side of the argument, particularly if you understand the political terrain of Nigeria, it needs so much money to fuel the political ambition. You can imagine the billions of Naira that you know, go into uh, furnishing this uh, pension. In 2019, the state's internal generated revenue for, uh, was about, one rand, about 12 billion Naira, talking about a uh, Jigawa state now, and the lowest in the country as at mid-2020 came to 3 billion in 2017. And you'd be amazed that in a state where the human beings live with less than 377 naira a day, that billions of naira are spent on former governors and their deputies. You know, they have uh, two vehicles replaceable every four years, six bedroom apartment, furnished office, two personal assistants below grade level 10, and two drivers. And in the case of Lagos State, they have house in Lagos, house in Abuja. And you combine that with those who are still serving the federal government, so that means they will have the official residence of the federal government, or probably that will be monetized. And I think 
And finally, on this uh, segment, if you are considerate about the people, then you must look at what you enjoy and benchmark it with the structure of the economy. And right now, okay. the economy of Nigeria is growing. People are going through hardship. So I must, on that note, partly commend the Lagos State government for reducing this uh, bogus allowance okay. with about 50%. But if you All ask right. me, me, you know, me, I think it should be f fully abrogated, removed completely. Okay. Achike Chude, um, it's interesting for a country where our, our resident doctors are being paid 5,000 naira for hazard allowance amidst a, a pandemic that is, is ravaging the world. And these people have to work under the harshest conditions um, with poor infrastructure. We still have teachers who are still pressuring government that if they are not paid certain allowances, they're going to go on strike. I mean, the list is endless. We have labor on one hand. Every now and again, they want to go. There are so many aspects of Nigeria's economy that has not been addressed. But we still haven't necessarily put our searchlights on the cost of governance. Um, so when will it become a necessity for our governments to look within and start cutting costs and not paying lip service to it? Hello, is that for me? Yes. Yeah, well, um, uh, the only reason why uh, this um, issue of um, the allowances and the pensions for ex-governors is not a criminal offense is simply because the legislators have used the instrumentality of the law to legitimize a morally offensive action. Otherwise, it would be a criminal action. And so it depends on how people, you know, uh, use the law. The law can be used to pervert the act, I mean, to pervert justice, or the law can be used to promote justice. In this case, in this case, the law is being used to pervert justice. You know, and um, again, this is typified what is happening with uh, these uh, pension laws across the state. Typifies, uh, you know, in vivid terms, at uh, the statement by Kamea, uh, the American journalist, in his book, This House Has Fallen, where he described the country, Nigeria, unfortunately, as a criminally wrong corporation, where the leaders are armed and are hidden in the safe. So this is one typical example of our leaders hiding in the safe, uh, you know, being protected by state resources while they are busy looting the country dry. I mean, I mean if you, uh, the, the, the law itself is as, 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 is as outrageous as any law can be, uh, you know, and uh, Brandon, you have just made, made, made a lot of points. And the points you made, I mean, talking about uh, the very serious uh, issues that we have, especially with some of the unions in the country, uh, these perennial, uh, you know, strikes by uh, the uh, NLC and the TUC, uh, also with all the problems they are having. Uh, now the doctors are on strike and all that. So, and then in the midst of this, uh, we, you find politicians and the elites that keep on asking people to make sacrifices while they are not ready to lift a hand to do also make their own sacrifices. Just today, I mean, the, the discourse, uh, today, at least from the past two, uh, you know, the past two days, has been about uh, the increase uh, in the fees paid for uh, licenses for 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 vehicle licenses, you know, uh, uh, for numbers. number plates yes. and, and driving licenses in the country. And this is just coming up again against the backdrop of uh, uh, the announcement by the Minister of um, Labour. I mean, the Minister of um, Works. Works that uh, they are going to bring toll gates back into the country. So you find out that everywhere you go, the people are being buffeted right, left, right, and center. People who cannot even carry out meaningful social existence, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, you, you know, no access to health care and so many other things. And the country keeps on putting more and more burden on them. So where do we know, go from them. here? We need to go. You know, what do we do? Yeah. What do we do? How do we wriggle ourselves out? Because look. You go to the market Sorry? today with 5,000 naira, you cannot buy anything meaningful. Yeah. But yet we have to pay for all of these things and we're taxed right, left, right and centre. Yeah. Where do we go from here in closing? Because we have to go. Well, is that for me? Yes. 
Well, the, the, the issue is that obviously the government is not working. Obviously, our political elites uh, have, have shown incapacity uh, to govern. The essence of the Constitution and the provision of the Constitution is for the welfare, for government to act in conformity with the welfare and safety of the people. It is not the business of government to keep on taking and taking from the people. So what you know, I would think, seriously, is that um, we need to begin to look inward. We need to begin to make serious sacrifices. And the leadership, the political leadership in this country must lead the way. But what we have seen so far is they are not interested in making sacrifices. The people must look for a way to put the sufficient pressure on them okay. and to tell them that they are not the ones that will continue to make the sacrifices on behalf of the nation. Majority okay. of the sacrifice must come from the people, from, from the leadership. That is the only way. If we somehow we, not, we, we are not able to get to that level of imposing this level of responsibility and duty and obligation on the political leadership, things will continue to get worse. And then well, they must look for other means of revenue. They keep on talking about Nigeria being a mono, you know, a, a, a economy. A mono economy, and that and the need, you know, to to also have other other sectors of the go. economy play a critical role in national economy. We have to go. Uh, unfortunately, time is not on our side. Um, Jideo Logun, uh, Atike Trude, thank you so much. I wish we had more time to talk about this, but I'm definite that it will come back to the fore and we will have to tear this apart. But thank you so much for speaking with us, gentlemen. That's Nigeria. All right. Well, we'll take a short break and uh, do a roundup of all the conversations we've had all through the week because that's what we do now. Uh, give you an idea of what we spoke about this week if you had not seen it. And for those who had seen it, let's rejig your memory. Let's start with the June 12 issue. He, he explained during that interview that if he had not done what he did, then there would have been a bloody coup. But why do you choose to say that he was afraid um, that he would be succeeded by a Yoruba person? I mean, they allowed the election to take place, even though the annulment was for security reasons, according to him. Uh, Mary, first of all, they, yes, they allowed the election to take place, but they never expected Abiola to win. They assumed that the Northerner would win because they have, apparently have the numbers. But what they didn't understand is that when a, when a leader sells a vision to his people, what happens is the vision is what the people believe in. The, the other candidate did not really have anything to say. Matter of fact, in that election, if you notice, there was a, actually a debate. In that debate, my father floored the... Um, the, his, running, his opponent, hands down, it was seen across Nigeria. People saw what they were going, what they were going to gain from Abiola. And when he talks about a coup, a bloodless coup, or a, a violent coup, my father was adamant on not being violent. My father was one who secured the nation from having blood all over the country. I want to start with the issue of Delegiwa. Why wasn't that issue followed? Please, please, follow please allow, me, allow me to respond to a few, you know, uh, submissions of uh, Abdul Mumini. You don't just ask questions. And question please make sure you answer by, mine too. By not, by not allowing me to follow up. Please, wait. First of all, IBB as a Nigerian and a former military president has the right to own an opinion is protected by the 1999 constitution as a fundamental human right of freedom to speak on issues and whether abdul Mumini lacks it or not he has a better knowledge better understanding of the intricate logic of the nigerian federation if there's anything called 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 the federation in this country there are a lot of achievements that i did uh, put forward when he was when he was president so the, the june 12th june 12th is just his car let me say clearly that if we had um, a truly federal constitution, if we had a system that allows for devolution of power and, if you like, resource control, we ordinarily would have had uh, states that are effective, efficient and effectual. We would have states that are viable. But tragically, what we have, which is a pseudo federal constitution, where you have a federal government that controls just about everything, where you have a rent-taking and a rent-seeking system. Uh, you have states that are practically, uh, if you like, uh, not viable. Uh, that is why most people who are opposed to the call for creation of more states uh, are of the opinion that uh, the taxes that you have 
how effective, how efficient are they, how uh, viable are they. But I, I want to say that uh, what we must do first in the call for a truly prosperous nation is to ask uh, uh, the National Assembly to allow for devolution of power, allow for resource control, such that states across this country will be able to manage their resources. But uh, I can tell you one thing for free. You know, uh, the average man on the street does not believe so. You have seen the NSAS riots, the NSAS uh, protests, and you know that those things, uh, that, 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 that protest almost went out of control. It almost became uh, uh, what we would call a fight for democracy. People had already started asking for the president to resign. It was no longer an end to police brutality. It had become, a, you know, uh, uh, a question of, of the systematic uh, or the systemic rule of the APC. And we're seeing that everywhere. Whose responsibility is it to give these young people a sense of direction? I, I, I'm hoping that you won't say government because government can't do everything for us. Where is the role of the home? Where is the whole role of society? Who are the mentors and, and the idols that these people are supposed to look to to give them a sense of direction? Please don't say government. I know you, 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 want me, you don't want me to say government, but the truth of the matter is that it is the government. When the government creates an institution or a system that directly engages the youth, maybe, for example, there is a youth... So, so you're telling me, I'm sorry, Shabu, you're telling me that families, that parents, that guardians, that people who are the ones that are responsible, of bring, uh, responsible for bringing up these young people should totally justice in that responsibility for the government. And so if government now is responsible for pointing your children in the right direction and telling them what to do, what do you as a parent do? What is your responsibility then? What, what I'm telling you is this. The parents have raised their kids. They have Have sent them to school. The educational system takes it from where they are in school to teach them, to get them to have the best education they can have in that educational system. But when they leave school and come back to the job market, when they go out there to seek for a job, they need something that gives them a sense of purpose. Maybe that gives them a sense of purpose of contributing positively to the society or to themselves. Well, that's what we had all through the week, a little bit of everything. My name is Mary Anakon. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you on Monday on Plus Politics.